Hello, everyone. Happy New Year from all of us at Aquatic Veterinary Services. We are still building our webinar schedule for 2019. So if anyone out there has any interest in hearing a specific webinar for 2019, please let us know. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the GoToWebinar platform, you have a little box on the side there, and there's a little spot near the bottom for questions. So please feel free to enter any questions that you have during the presentation in that box, and I will get to them towards the end. However, on my end, they are very, very small boxes, so it might take me a minute to go through everything. So in our webinar today, we will be talking about fish tank troubleshooting. Now, there are many, many specific issues that you can get into with fish tanks, but for today, we're gonna to be covering some broad topics. So first starting out with new systems, and this is a system that is pretty much straight out of the box. Established systems, and by established, we mean that they actually have a biologic filter, so they've been running for at least a month or so. And then regardless of how old your tank is, some best tank practices to make sure that your fish stay ha happy and healthy. So starting out with a new system. So again, a new system is essentially brand new, just out of the packaging, or if you have a system that has been taken offline, bleached and cleaned, that would essentially also be a new system. So when you first get your system with everything in the box, you're gonna take it out and clean it with just some hot soapy water and rinse it really, really well. You also wanna make sure that you rinse all of your filtration and this includes the zeolite, those little chunky white donuts, and the carbon especially, because those can have lots of little tiny particulates that you don't want ending up in the rest of the water. Now, some of these tanks have these silly little flossy filters. Um, unfortunately, they're not meant to hold up to long-term use. Um, I highly recommend swapping them out for these sturdier sponges. They come in a lot of different sizes and you can cut them to whatever size you need. Those little flossy ones usually have some carbon in the middle, which you may or may not need. Uh, really for most fish tanks, you're gonna need the big sturdier sponge that's gonna last you a lot longer than those floss filters. So the most common problem we see with new systems is new tank syndrome. And essentially this means that your biologic filtration is completely unestablished. Now, this will happen in every single new tank that is ever set up. There are some multiple, multiple quick start products. Basically it's bacteria in some sort of bottle. Um, our office has independently tested at least half a dozen, if not a full dozen of these products and we were not able to get any appreciable decrease in the time it took to establish the filter. A lot of these companies, when we talk to them in person, they're not aware what species they have in there, how they're packaged, are they packaged for long-term shelf life? Have they been exposed to anything that would reactivate them and cause them to either burn out really fast, or they might not even be the right species for your tank. So there are many, many of products available that say they will instantly start your system and you don't need to worry about it. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that they're all wrong. It's complete marketing. When you are just starting out, it's gonna take four to six weeks minimum to establish your filtration. So what do we mean when we're talking about biologic filtration? Well, this all goes back to the nitrogen cycle. This occurs in all systems that have fish in them. For fish, their primary waste product is going to be ammonia. They actually excrete most of it out through their gills. Through nitrification, this is converted into nitrite. Well, nitrite itself still is not very safe. At high levels in the water, the nitrite can actually competitively bind to the hemoglobin in the blood. So usually this is gonna be transporting oxygen, but due to the way that nitrite is built, 
it can actually kick off that oxygen. So a fish's hemoglobin might just be having nitrite and therefore having no oxygen. It's a syndrome called methemoglobinemia and essentially causes a fish to asphyxiate or won't be able to have enough oxygen in their tissues. Further nitrification of the nitrite comes down to nitrate. Now this is what your aquatic plants and your algae use as a food source. So when you do those water changes, you're actually removing that final stage of nitrates out of the water. Now nitrates, depending on what species of fish you have, are usually relatively safe. Some species can handle very, very high levels. Other species cannot really handle much at all. So it really depends on your fish species and how tolerant they are to having those nitrate levels rise up. Now, some of you are probably wondering where did those nitrosomus and nitrobacter genuses of bacteria go? Well, it used to be pretty much the standard uh, nitrosomus and nitrobacter were the primary bacteria responsible for running this cycle. However, new research has shown that there are hundreds of different bacteria species that contribute to this cycle. So it's not really fair to just say nitrosomus and nitrobacter anymore. Now, in a brand new tank, you don't have these happy nitrifying bacteria that are gonna get the cycle going right away. So in a new tank, if you're watching your parameters closely, you'll be able to produce a graph that looks like this. So this is essentially illustrating what new tank syndrome works or looks like. So first, your fish are gonna build up ammonia. And since, again, there is no bacteria there, it's gonna go to a relatively high level. Now, these bacteria will come with the fish. They just have to be able to get established. So again, once there's enough food, i.e. the ammonia for them to eat, those bacteria are gonna start decreasing the amount of ammonia, and then you're gonna have a nitrite spike. So again, we need more bacteria to come in there and grow, and they will get there. You don't need to dump anything in. And then slowly, those nitrites will start being converted to nitrates. Now, unfortunately, that's the end. So either your nitrates are gonna go up and up and up, or you do a water change to remove them from your system. So all new systems, if you have brand new sparkling filter media, will go through this cycle. And this is really why you don't want to squeaky clean your biologic filtration every time you do maintenance on your system, because you're essentially gonna be starting this from the beginning every single time. And your fish don't really like that. They'd rather have no ammonia, no nitrite, maybe a little bit of nitrate. So in new systems, how do we avoid catastrophes with these ammonia and nitrite spikes? So really the best thing that you should do as a new tank owner is to start with a low bio load. So what does this mean? This means that you're gonna start with just a few fish and a significantly fewer fish than the total end population that you want for your tank. So the more water that you have and the fewer fish, they're not gonna be producing as much ammonia and therefore you're not gonna get as high of an ammonia and nitrite spike. So again, starting with a low bio load, those fish aren't gonna go through so much of a shock. It's very important that you test your water frequently so you can watch for those spikes and see when they start to go down. Certainly if your ammonia is starting to go up into the twos and threes, it's gonna be time for a water change just to make sure your fish aren't gonna die. We highly recommend that you use these liquid-based drop test kits. Um, Sarah makes another one as well. Um, really, if there's nothing better to use, use these test strips, but I recommend you just get rid of them altogether. Uh, the Freshwater Master Test Kit plus the GH and KH is only gonna run you about 25 to 30 bucks. You can get it on Amazon. So make sure that you test your water frequently and you can make a graph like we had. It'll be a lot more precise than the guessing that we did. Now, once your system is starting to be established, you're gonna add your fish very slowly. Make sure you add them in groups by species, especially if you have smaller fish that like to school together, such as zebrafish or neon tetras. If you are doing any more aggressive species that really like their space in territories, make sure to add them last. 
because if you add them first, they're not going to let anyone else move into their hood. And if you are going to be adding new fish on a regular basis, you want to make sure that you quarantine all new fish separately by batch from the pet store and in a hospital tank. So from our quarantine webinar, quarantine essentially means a separate tank with separate filtration and equipment. Thankfully, if you have a brand new tank, this is gonna be starting out as a hospital tank. Now, once your fish clear quarantine, go move into the big tank, hold on to that hospital and quarantine tank because it's always nice to have just in case something gets into your system, you'll have it at the ready. It does not need to be running. It does not need to be large. Well, it has to at least be big enough for your largest fish. So again, if we're dealing with goldfish, it's gonna have to be at least five gallons, if not bigger, um, in order to make sure that they're going to be able to move into isolation if they get sick. So really with new tanks and new systems, this is gonna be the biggest deal, is making sure that you manage your ammonia and nitrite levels so you don't wipe out all of your populations. The biggest problem that we see with new tank owners is that they go too big too fast and they rely on those quick start products. I'm sorry to say we've tried them, they don't work. There was one that got us maybe one week closer, but just be patient, start with just a few fish. I guarantee you'll get there, but it just you need to go through those new tank syndrome stages in order to make sure that your system is going to be long lived. So now moving on to established systems. So if you have a tank, what are some of the biggest problems that we see that a lot of owners run into? Well, on the other side of new tank syndrome is a syndrome called old tank syndrome. And this just doesn't mean your system has been around for a long time. It's usually a system with minimal, irregular, or lazy maintenance. So what happens in these systems is your KH goes to zero. This is your buffer and your alkalinity. Once you have no more buffers and your fish are still in there respirating and producing carbon dioxide, your pH is gonna start to decrease. And we've seen levels between six and as low as four. So unfortunately with that, your biologic filtration probably isn't gonna be around and therefore your ammonia is gonna increase. So this sounds like the perfect fish killing environment and everybody would have to notice it right away. Well, unfortunately, the hardest thing to see about this is the ammonia levels actually don't hurt the fish since the um, hydrogen ion concentration converts it to a non-toxic form. So again, remember, there's a higher hydrogen ion concentration in more acidic waters with a lower pH. It's a little bit counterintuitive. So lower pH, higher hydrogen ion concentration, more non-toxic ammonia. So the hardest part about this is you're really not gonna see many clinical signs that point exactly to this syndrome. You might have increased disease, you might have a few mortalities. Usually you might start losing maybe one fish a month, but it's really not something that you can see clearly unless you have a test kit. And obviously if your pH is way below your scale and you don't have any KH, this is pretty much the perfect description of old tank syndrome. But however, once it has been diagnosed, you do not want to correct this quickly. A big water change will cause a pH shock and kill all your fish, not to mention re-release all that ammonia into a toxic form. So again, even when you're correcting back to the original correct water quality, you're going to do this very, very slowly by doing very small water changes and you want to do barely five to ten percent every few days now it's very important that you check your source water to make sure that your kh is adequate some tap water unfortunately doesn't have a lot of buffers coming into it so you're going to have to add synthetic buffers if it's too low so they do have lots of commercial buffers available in the pet store but baking soda will work just fine as well if you'd rather spend the $7, go for it. If you'd want to spend under a dollar, you can use the baking soda. We use baking soda all the time. It works great. With these changes, 
the old tank syndrome will improve over a few weeks and then you come back to your regular water changing maintenance schedule i'll give you an example of that in a little bit but the biggest thing with old tank syndrome is it happens over many months that you get to this point and it's just because you haven't been able to do your water changes the kid who cleaned your tank is away at college but it happens over time and can be corrected if you can catch it early. But again, if you find that your pH is very low and you don't have buffers, don't do a big water change. Do lots of very small water changes and you'll be able to get everything back to where it needs to be. So the other biggest issue that we see in established systems is adding new fish. So you have your tank just the way you want it. Maybe you've had a few fish die here and there from unrelated things. You think, okay, well, we're gonna add some new fish. Go to the pet store, grab some fish, toss them right in, and oh look, they wiped out your entire tank. When you're adding new fish, you must quarantine them in a separate system with separate filtration and separate equipment. Don't even keep it in the same room if it's too hard for you. Do not assume that any new fish are safe unless they are quarantined under trained supervision for four to six weeks. And this does not count the high school kids at the PetSmart. Most fish that come into pet stores are there for less than five days. So why should you be concerned that, okay, well, they've been there for 24 hours. Why is this, I mean, they've been there. They, they took a look, they're taking a look at them and seeing what's going on and they'll treat them if they're sick. Well, unfortunately, the most common problem that we see with fish that come directly from the pet store is white spot. Now, why is this a problem? So again, we have to look back at our ick life cycle. So you can see here, the fish with the actual white spots are gonna have those big replicating bodies in their gills. That's really what you're gonna see those big white spots Four. Now, those big white spots, we're going to divide into a, a thousand little thurons that eventually break out of that cyst and go to infect a whole other host of fish. These reproductive stages with that U-shaped nucleus are in the gills. And unfortunately, not many species that I know parade around with their gills out for everybody to see. So a fish that looks healthy in a pet store could have one of these cysts in their gills and release a thousand little guys in the next day or so. And again, they're not gonna be giving any clinical signs at that time. They're gonna be breathing normally, they're gonna be swimming and eating normally. And this ick life stage, life cycle, can take anywhere from seven to 21 days to complete. And this is gonna be dependent on the temperature of the water. So a lot of these fish, when they're packaged and shipped, their temperature is gonna drop, especially in the winter. It happens, plain undercarriages are very cold. So this slows down the life cycle while the fish is in transport. They get to the happy pet store, they're unpacked and sit around, again, only a couple days. When they go home, though it's gonna be nice and warm, indoor tank usually, again, we're talking about tanks, and as soon as these little buggies get the chance, they're going to replicate. And again, one of the replicating bodies, those cysts, produce a thousand infecting agents. So this is why a fish might appear completely healthy at the pet store. And as soon as you bring it home two to three weeks later, everything's dead. So this is why we quarantine fish. This is why you must do it from the pet store. They're not around the pet store very long. They want to get them out before they show signs of disease because if the fish shows signs of disease, they have to pay to treat it. And that makes that fish more expensive for them. So that's why these stores have very high turnover. So a lot of people ask, can I add some sort of prophylactic treatment to my quarantine and make sure that it's super short? Well, first thing we're gonna ask is, do you know what you're treating for? Do you have a list of all the possible parasites, bacteria, viruses? And again, if you're looking at white spot disease, that cyst stage where everything's dividing is completely resistant to other treatments. You can't get it with salt. You can't get it with malachite green. You can't get it with formalin. 
only the Theron free swimming stage can be treated. And unfortunately, if you don't know when that fish was infected, you don't know the temperature of your water, you don't really know when everything's gonna break loose and cause disease. So, and again, if you don't know what you're treating for, and you're just gonna basically hit it with everything that you have and hope that you get it, this is where we get resistant strains of bacteria and parasites. Viruses is something different. But if you're treating a fish that has no clinical signs of disease, and a couple of these bacteria are just kind of hanging out, once they are exposed to, say, an, an over-the-counter antibiotic, and they survive, this one bacteria exposed to the exposed to the antibiotic, all the other bacteria who are susceptible to that antibiotic die, and it gives room and resources for these resistant bacteria to grow. So it's very important that when you are treating fish in quarantine, you need to know exactly what you are treating for or else A, it's not gonna do anything, or B, you could be breeding resistant strains of parasites and bacteria. This is how we get all of those uh, resistant um, anaerobes infections. So. so again, with established systems, it is old tank syndrome, where you just haven't been on top of your cleaning, and adding new fish where people hit the most problems. So now we're gonna be moving on to best tank practices. So how do we make sure that our fish tank will stay happy and healthy for the rest of our days? Well, of course, we're going to quarantine all new additions in a separate system with separate filtration and separate equipment. Is there enough room in your tank to bring in new fish? Certainly, if you're looking to upgrade your system, you want something bigger and better, sure, yes, add new fish. Now, the rule that we've used in the past is you do one inch of fish per one gallon of water. And I'm sorry, but I'm gonna throw that out entirely because unfortunately, with all the different species of fish that there are available for home hobbyists right now, this rule does not take into consideration the species need to either be schooling or be separate. Their feed to weight conversion, basically how much they eat versus how much they poop. Goldfish are notoriously bad converters, so they eat a lot and they poop a lot. And then their lifestyle. Is this a fish that is going to need a lot of water? Do they like to have very specific water quality parameters? Is a one inch of neon tetra the same as an inch of goldfish? The answer is obviously not. You can since neon tetras like to school together, they take up considerable less amount of room. So unfortunately, there is no good guideline to how many fish you should put in a fish tank. It's just going to vary too much on how the tank is set up, the filtration, the water quality parameters, the different species, the individual tendencies. So as a veterinary practitioner, I am going to push you on the side of less is more. And certainly the fewer fish you have, the more wiggle room you have in your water quality. So if you don't get to that cleaning one week or so, it gives you a little bit of a bubble. So I'm sure the tank would look prettier if you put more fish in there. But again, in order to fish to have long and happy lives, more space is usually better for them. So with a tank, you want to set up a regular maintenance schedule. And it's great if you can get the whole family involved. Again, those little kids can scrub too. Now, this is just an example of what you should do on a daily, weekly, and monthly, and even a yearly basis. Now, for those of you attending this live, we've included this checklist in your handouts. Feel free to print it out. You can put people's initials next to what they're supposed to do. Um, for those of you who are watching this at a later date, you can get this schedule on our website. But it's very important to have this marked in your calendar every week. This is the day that we clean the fish tank or our monthly cleaning. This is the day that we rinse our biological filtration. Again, this is going to completely depend on the stocking load of your tank and how powerful your filter is. Some of these monthly tasks should be weekly. Some of these weekly tasks could be monthly. Again, there's wiggle room, but make it work for you 
and make sure to get the entire family involved. Everybody enjoys the fish tank. They should all be a part of it. So in addition to that, some people do not know even how to clean a tank, how to properly clean a tank. So this video is available on our YouTube page and we'll watch it right now together on how to properly clean a fish tank. I'm Katrina and we're at Aquatic Veterinary Services today to show you a simple and effective way to clean your fish tank. Let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about basic fish tank maintenance. First, we're going to go over what equipment you'll need. It is very important that all equipment used for aquarium maintenance is solely used for that purpose. Do not use this equipment for household chores or anything else that might introduce chemical residues into your tank. You will need a gravel siphon. You will need an algae scrubber. Make sure you have the right one for your tank, whether it's acrylic or glass. You're going to need a bucket, one that can hold 4% of your tank's water. You will need a dechlorinator, and you want to make sure that it treats both chlorine and chloramine. And you will need a thermometer. Before we get started, make sure you wash your hands to remove any residue, such as soap, food, lotion, or perfume. Now that you've got all your equipment, we can get started. Start by unplugging your aquarium's lights, heater, and filtration. If the water level drops, you do not want your filter to run dry or your heater to be exposed to air if they aren't turned off. Next, let's scrub the algae from the sides of the aquarium and from the decor. Before you start scrubbing, be sure to check your algae scrubber for any substrate that can have gotten caught in there. You want to make sure to remove this as it can cause scratches on your acrylic or glass. Now that we've scrubbed the algae off, we can start to gravel wash with the gravel siphon. Before you get going, make sure to remove that decor so you can gravel siphon underneath. That's where a lot of waste can get trapped. Insert the siphon into the gravel and wait a few seconds to allow the waste to move through the substrate and up the siphon. Continue to siphon your aquarium substrate evenly until the water level has dropped about 25 to 30%. Be sure to keep an eye on the water traveling into your bucket so it doesn't overflow. Now remove your filter media, whether it's sponges, balls, or rocks, and rinse them in your wastewater. If you rinse your filter media in water other than your tank water, you run the risk of killing your beneficial bacteria. Anything that is visible to the naked eye is not what you want to keep. The beneficial bacteria is only visible under a microscope. These do not have to be sparkling clean, but you do want to remove whatever waste is trapped in them. Now you can put your filter media back and dump your wastewater. Rinse and then fill your bucket with tap water to the same level as the water you've removed. Add your dechlorinator for the dosage instructions and check the water temperature to make sure it matches the temperature of your aquarium's water. Adding water that is too hot or too cold can stress out and harm your fish. Turn on your lights, heater, and filtration. And if your filtration is having trouble getting started again, try adding some of your tank water to its reservoir to give it a boost. Make sure to wash your hands and you are all done. Repeat this every week to maintain a clean aquarium and healthy water quality. Thank you for watching our video. If you would like more information on fish health and husbandry, please check out our other videos in our website. So you think it would be something pretty straightforward, but we find that a lot of people can benefit from just getting a straight tutorial on how to clean a fish tank. So in addition to being able to clean on a regular basis and on proper instructions, you wanna make sure that you have a test kit that you know how to use and is reliable. You wanna make sure that includes the following parameters. So you have your ammonia, your nitrite, your nitrate, pH, KH, and temperature. Now, just one note that the API Freshwater Master Test Kit does not include GH, KH, or temperature. Uh, GH is testing for water hardness, and this really isn't going to change too much for most systems. So they do make a separate just KH kit if you want to use that. And what we recommend is you have this lovely spreadsheet here so you can keep an eye on your trends and know what's normal. Again, for those of you who are attending live with us, you have this included in your handouts. 
We have this available on our website as well. So if you want to print this out and make it your own, feel free to go ahead. So again, you want to make sure that you have a hospital tank ready at all times. And it does not need to be large. It does not need to be running at all times. However, if you do need to put a fish in there, keep in mind that the new tank syndrome will likely occur. So you want to make sure you keep a close eye on your parameters. You want to be sure to move any sick or injured fish into that hospital tank as soon as possible. You don't want to leave them in the tank to either spread disease or get harassed by their tank mates. The only thing that you can add to a hospital tank is salt. And you can add up to 0.3%, which is 3 grams per liter. And this is it. This is the only prophylactic thing I will let you add to a tank. Um, it helps with osmoregulation and the uptake of chloride and oxygen across the gills. So in addition to getting the family involved, you want to make sure that your kids know the basics of fish care. And I've written the whole chill book series on this because it's really important to get them involved at a young age and know what they're doing correctly. So for those of you who are interested, the series is available on our um, Amazon author page. Um, Dr. Sanders also usually carries a couple copies with her. So if you're interested in having her bring some during one of your fish appointments, feel free to let us know. And with that, that's covered all of the fish tank troubleshooting and basic health uh, issues that we see with fish tanks. Again, I really wish I could have made this more specific, but there's just too many variables to consider. If you have a specific question about a tank, please, um, you can either let me know in the questions and I will get to it now. Um, if not, um, you can visit our website and either give us a call or drop us a line and we're happy to tank any questions at this time. All right, one question here about over-the-counter antibiotics. Um, so if you've heard me lecture before, yes, technically, according to the FDA, the antibiotics on pet store shelves are technically illegal. However, they're not at a level that they really care to enforce. So yes, you can get over-the-counter medications in the pet store. However, with this caveat that no government body is checking that these medications are what they say they are. And this also goes for any over-the-counter medication that you buy online. There have been major aquariums that have bought stuff thinking it was one thing and it turned out to be something completely different. So if you need a medication to treat your fish, unfortunately, Due to federal regulations, a veterinarian is not able to prescribe any medication without definitive diagnosis that they have made themselves. This requires the establishment of a veterinarian client patient relationship, a VCPR. And it means that the veterinarian has to examine that patient in person. You can't do it over email, you can't do it over the phone, you can't do it over text messages. And this is state and federal law. Now, Given how much technology is improving, this may change over time. I would not be surprised if we could do something different down the line. But unfortunately, if you need a specific medication, a veterinarian cannot give it to you without seeing that fish. And it's just the rules we have to play by. So I'm really sorry if you're hoping for a specific diagnosis today. Um, but yes, yeah, so again, you can get all these medications in the pet store. There's no guarantee that they are what they say they are. They're going to do what they say they are. So we highly recommend getting a professional in there to make sure that they're not going to kill your fish. All right, questions. Okay, we have a quick question about dechlorinators. So in the video, we showed somebody using stress cup. Is this what we prefer? I honestly do not care what brand of conditioner you use as long as it treats chlorine and chloramine. There are so many different ones out there. Um, certainly you can use what you want. Um, you can use sodium thiosulfate. That's kind of the old school method for treating just chlorine. However, if you're using it to treat chloramine, you will release all of the ammonia into your system and produce an ammonia spike. If you know that you have straight chlorine, you can use the bubble off method, which is where you aerate your volume of water for 24 hours. Since chloramine is a more stable compound, you cannot bubble it off 
unless you do it for a very long time. So it's highly recommended that you use one of the many commercial dechlorinators that they have. And they've actually found that stress coat does absolutely nothing to the fish mucus. Uh, Dr. Lubart out of NC State wrote a paper on it if you want to check that out. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I don't have any preferences. It's just what we grabbed to make the movie. <laughs> um, any more questions? Well, that's it for today then. Thank you very much, all of you who joined us. Uh, we'll be back next month with our water quality. Always a favorite of mine. So with that, everyone have a lovely evening or afternoon, and we hope to see you again next month. Take care.